Okay, as promised, I will go over the uh, test. Uh, it's the optics test. And uh, we might as well do the 8 o'clock uh, class uh, first here. And the first problem, trying to uh, remember the first problem. Um, oh, yeah, it's about uh, Polaroids. Um, and so this is after, uh, after uh, 20, uh, 38, chapter 38. Uh, anyways, the problem, um, may, maybe the, even the hardest part of the problem is the beginning part is the conceptual idea uh, that you have some sunlight. And in this case, I'll call it intensity I naught, which they say is a thousand watts per square meter. And you want some way to control it. And hopefully what you got out of the, the, the reading and the uh, uh, lecture videos was that the first polarizing sheet uh, really can't do much of uh, anything or there's only one thing that it can do. And that is, let's just say the polarizing sheet is set up so that the transmission axis are vertical. And so once the light goes through, um, the electric field, what it will do is it'll make an electric field that is only in the direction of the transmitting axis. So anything that's horizontal will be blocked. And basically the uh, sunlight is unpolarized, meaning it has just as much in a vertical direction as a horizontal, and then all these angled ones that are combinations of horizontal and vertical. And so the first polarizing uh, sheet will then block half of it and cut it down to a uh, half a watt, I guess. Uh, in the video lecture, it looked like this, that you would get half the intensity. But not only do you get half the intensity, you then get polarized light so that then if you were to then take a second polarizing sheet that maybe had its uh, transmission axis tilted, and so I'll, I'll do a little tilt here, uh, you would say then that what was coming through could be made out of a part that is along the transmission axis if it is rotated by some angle and a part that's perpendicular and the whole idea of the second polarizing sheet is it would block the stuff that is is perpendicular and so what would get out on the other side would also be polarized light and the intensity would be the intensity over here maybe I'll call it number one and this number two and so the electric field number two would be E1 times cosine of the angle, or the intensity over here uh, being the square of it, and so I'll call intensity number two, uh, would be really the intensity on, on this side, which we've already called it uh, I naught over two, and then this squared would be cosine of, of theta. And the problem is trying to get for this final intensity to be cut down to 375. So uh, this is really based upon understanding the polarization. The math really isn't uh, too hard. It, it just basically uh, says this, that the overall intensity is 375. Uh, you start with 1,000. The first polarizing sheet cuts that in half. And the second one cuts out depending on what the angle is. And so that's really the answer to this question. How would you use two polarizing sheets? What you would do is put a first one any way you wanted. And then the second one would then be rotated at some angle that we have to solve for uh, relative uh, to that. So let's see, 500 cosine squared theta. And if you run through the math, then you're going to find here that theta is 30 degrees. And so there's the answer to number one, 30 degrees. All right, so right out of chapter uh, 38. Now on to number two. Number two is uh, oh, a telescope. Uh, it's more than that, though. Um, it's not only a telescope, but it's also a thin film. And so we've got two things we have to... Uh, put together the uh, thin film from 
chapter, ooh, is that 38? I think that's 38. And then the uh, diffraction of what's going on, and uh, that's, I believe, also 38 here. Um, or maybe the thin film's 37. Not sure about what chapter it is, but it's those two concepts uh, that we have to put together. And so the first one, I'll just kind of uh, make the uh, thin thin film. And so this, what that little kind of that coin looking or disc thing is, is saying the light's coming in. And so uh, what's going to end up happening is the light's going to hit and some of it will bounce off, but some of it will go through then bounce off the other layer. And these two coming back here on reflection will then have some interference. And uh, if what you got out of the video lecture, um, if we say that the thin film has a thickness of T, then what I like to call the path difference delta is 2T. Um, in other words, this one that goes through or into the thin film and bounce off, and that's even before it gets into the telescope itself, and so it's going to eventually go into the telescope. But the real first part of this question is what actually gets into the telescope. And so the, the extra path length to T, um, if that is an integer number of wavelengths, and I should say wavelengths in the thin film, uh, then you would expect to get constructive interference. But that, of course, is without any phase changes. So to add to this, we need to label this and say, okay, telescope has air on the, on the outside, and then it hits this calcium fluoride um, boundary, which is an index of 1.43. Um, and then this is coated on top of the, the lens, and so the next part of this would be glass. And uh, the crown glass has an index of 1.52. So the reflection off of here and the reflection off of here each undergo a phase change. And so, again, to decide whether we have constructive or destructive interference, we're looking at the relative difference between these two. And so... Uh, is there a phase shift? Sure, but they both have one. So in a sense, we can just I ignore them. We, uh, we're just looking at, at you know, how, they, how they differ. So uh, I don't even think about the phase shifts. I just have to know then that if 2t equals an integer number of wavelengths, uh, I would get constructive interference. That means I'd get a lot of light on reflection. Uh, I guess that also means then if 2t equals an integer and a half wavelengths, I would get a minimum upon reflection. But the other part of this is to keep in mind we're not looking at uh, the reflected uh, light. We're looking at the transmitted light, what actually goes in. And so using the idea of conservation of, of energy, if we're not looking at reflected light, but we're looking at the transmitted light, uh, the switch uh, rolls here. And so this becomes the equation for the uh, minimums, and this becomes the equation for the maximum. So in other words, if it, you know, maximum means it, that that wavelength is reflected, that means it is not transmitted or vice versa. All right, so again, our problem then centers around this step once we figure out which is the right uh, equation uh, to use. And so we're going to then say that, okay, what, what, what wavelength uh, uh, is this? And I will take, and then of course have the 2t, and if I divide it by the m plus half, and keep in mind this would be wavelength over the, the index, or just wavelength by itself would be 2t over n, and then m plus a half, where m can start off at zero and then keep increasing. So if I put in this uh, number here, this would be a 2, and the thickness is the uh, 96, oh, let me look here, was it 96.2? 
uh, nanometers, and the index is the 1.43. Uh, then I can divide that by, and I'll just put m plus a half. And so putting in these numbers where m is equals to 0, this would be 550 nanometers. Uh, the next one, actually I didn't write it down, so maybe I better uh, calculate it now. 2 times uh, 96.2 times 1.43 equals. Okay. And then this time let me divide it by, put a 1 here. That would be three and a half, so 1.5. And so I'm going to get a pretty small uh, wavelength. And that's the, the point to notice here, then that this wavelength just keeps getting smaller and, and smaller. Uh, so the only one that is relevant for this problem would be in the visible range. And so the 550 nanometers would be what is actually going to then enter... Uh, the telescope, out of all these uh, options, only this one's in the visible, so that's the only one that's relevant to somebody looking into a, a telescope. So that's kind of the, the first half of number two, figuring out uh, what wavelength to be uh, concerned about. And the other part is uh, the um, minimum that you can separate two objects, and so... Maybe I'll draw a little picture here, but if we had an opening and we had light coming from one object, and so this is uh, looking at something on the, on the moon. So let's say we have a, a crater and a second crater. And as we go to, to look at it, the light as it comes in spreads out. And the light that comes in then spreads out. And so that was our diffraction pattern. And it was the Riley criterion that said, okay, what is that minimum? And his argument was, well, you can just barely tell that there's two if there's kind of these two humps that show up on the uh, screen, either a screen you're looking at or this is the retina of your eye or this is the CCD array in a camera. But they've got to be at least this far apart. So the maximum of one needs to be at the minimum of the of the other. And so using the idea of the diffraction gradient, uh, I'm sorry, the um, diffraction pattern uh, is A sine theta equals an integer number of wavelength. And so the minimum occurs when M equals one. And so sine theta. And so this is our little formula that tells us what that, that minimum condition is. Is And that's why it was important in this first half to find this right here, uh, what's the uh, a wavelength. So I will put here 550 nanometers. And the opening of that hole, it's a, it's a pretty good size uh, hole here, uh, but it is our 25.4 centimeters. I'll be careful here with my my units. In fact, maybe I'll just write that then as 550 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. And then this would be uh, centimeters. I'll move it over 2. So this would be 0.254 uh, uh, meters there. And so that's the kind of the, the, the spread to it. Now, with that in mind, then, then uh, we're looking something way on, on the moon. So let's say from here to here is some distance away. And so these are spread out by some distance uh, y. And so roughly sine theta, which is roughly the same as tangent theta, which is roughly the theta, which is all of, of, of this, is just equal then to this y over this d. And so this y over d is equal to this 550 times 10 to the minus 9 meters over 0.254 uh, meters. And, uh, oh, and I apologize, I was a little uh, lazy here. Uh, this is what we worked out in, in, in terms of the lecture uh, because we worked it out for a single slit. Uh, for something that is circular, 
Um, that involves a little more computation, a circular object, and we'd have to uh, get what's called an Aries pattern uh, after that. And then this would be the root of the first Bessel function. But um, I think your author feels like uh, Bessel functions are... Uh, and two-dimensional integrals are beyond the scope of this class. So he doesn't really explain the 1.22 for a circular one. He, he does go through what, what I just described was the diffraction for a single uh, slit, but then just points out that it would be a little different, and that, that, that's really what it would be, is that uh, in you know two dimensions, instead of light going through a circle, I mean, compared to a slit, uh, there's a different uh, set of uh, interference. And so this is the... Uh, first, uh, this comes from the first solution of a, the uh, zero Bessel function. Uh, so uh, I forgot my 1.22, so I should really kind of throw that in there here, 1.22 uh, 1 there, and I need to kind of at least justify it, even if I'm not going to uh, uh, calculate it here. But uh, that would be the uh, setup. Uh, so if you put in your numbers all the way to the moon, and so this D is the 3.84 times 10, what does it say here, times 10 to the 8th. And I put in that, 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 and, and move that over to there, I get uh, 1,000 and about 14 meters. It's going to be significant figures. I'll just take that as approximately one. A kilometer. And so a 10-inch uh, uh, telescope here uh, Is that 10 inches? Yeah, it must be uh, 10 inches because um, 1 inch is 2 point, yeah, 5, 4. A uh, 10-inch telescope, kind of a standard telescope then. You, you can see uh, craters that are separated uh, by about a kilometer, at least from the optics you can. And then you got other issues to, to worry about here. But that's what uh, that one was after. How, how well can you see with this 10-inch uh, uh, telescope here? And so two craters or two mountain peaks that are separated by a kilometer, you'd be able to kind of tell, be pretty blurry, but you'd just be able to tell that there, there's a two mountain uh, peaks or or two craters, it wouldn't blur all together and just look like uh, like one. All right, well, if that made sense, we'll move on here to uh, uh, number three. And uh, number three, again, is conceptually probably the hardest part of this, uh, although we uh, had a homework problem uh, like this. And uh, basically, this one is uh, out of chapter 38, but it does the double slit diffraction, the young double slit fraction from 37, then 38. And, and what it's saying here is kind of the overall picture that what you first learned in 37 is that the light from a double slit would interfere with itself, and you'd make this fringe pattern, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark. But even though this is what was worked out in chapter 37, it wasn't quite the whole story because that's what you would get if the, you know, the light came from this opening with equal intensities. And so the interference you get here uh, basically is the same logic as over here. Um, even though they're different angles, if the light is the same in each of those angles, you get the same maximum here that you would get here, and you get here, and you get here, and you would each get a, a minimum. And so that's kind of what we first saw in chapter 37, but then we added to that in chapter 38 saying, well, when the light comes from a single slit of width A, and so usually we use the D here for the distance between the uh, double slit, but we, we, we learned that the light does not s spread out with equal intensities. And in fact, most of the light goes right to the center and off to the side. Uh, there's actually um, no light. That's the first uh, interference from all the uh, little pieces that were worked out from the single slit. And then it kind of tapers off in what's called a sink function. This was a, a sine x over x, and then the intensity.
intensity is, is squared. So that's our uh, fancy math term, a sink function. And this, this sink function then needs to be incorporated with the double slit. And so if you didn't quite figure this out because of the way the, the book is laid out, they uh, try not to explain the single slit because the single slit's harder to understand than the double slit, yet both are going on at the same time. And so your author goes through a double slit without worrying about the effect of diffraction at first, and but doesn't stop there, and then but ends the chapter there. And so hopefully you you pick that up so that what you would get is a pattern that would look, and you would have this, what we call a diffraction envelope. And so you would have the sink function, because that would be the intensity coming from a single slit description. And then the interference from the double slit would give you bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, and then maybe right here, uh, and this is the interesting part of this question, one would be missing. And what we mean by that is it should be bright. You would get constructive interference from the double slip. But the problem is it's missing. It's not there. It's not there because even though the condition is just right or the geometry is just right for constructive interference, you are not getting any light in that direction. So it's, it's not there. It's missing. So in my picture, it looks like if we call this the zero and one, two, it looks like the third one's missing. I, I see in this problem, let me see, I think, it, yeah, the fourth one is missing. And if we go on, this one says the eighth is missing, so there'd be another one missing there. And so in, in my case, I'm missing the zero, one, two, the third, and I'm going to be missing the, the, the sixth. And so the uh, fourth one would be here, the fifth one would be here. Um, and then the sixth one is, is missing. That wasn't a very good drawing, but four, five, and, and six. Uh, but the uh, whole idea is it's, it's missing. So that's all the background. That's the, the part you got to think about. That's the part I think that makes it a, a hard problem because then once we've, we've done that, we can then say, okay, well, what was the condition for con constructive interference for the double slit. This is it, d sine theta equals to m lambda. And then what was the condition for the missing or the no light? Uh, and that was the chapter 38. Uh, now written like this, it can get a little confusing because this looks like the... Uh, uh, the, these are the same value, but, but they're not. This is the constructive one, and this is the one that is uh, destructive from the or the diffraction missing uh, piece. So as we read this, it says the fourth one. So this would be a 4 lambda here. And if that's the first one missing, then this would be a 1 lambda over there. And so I've got my sine theta, I've got my d, here I've got my a, and here I've got my sine theta, okay? And, and so what we're asked to, to solve for in this uh, problem is what is the size of uh, the opening? And so we're looking here for, for A. And so maybe if I take this and bring it over, so I got D uh, sine theta equals to four over lambda, uh, then the math really becomes pretty easy. The wavelengths cancels off, the angle cancels off, and so A over D is equal to one-fourth. Or moving the D over to here, we're saying that A, the size of the uh, hole, is one-quarter of the, of the spacing uh, between them. And this uh, problem says the spacing, where did it go here? Oh, there it is. It's right in the first sentence, one millimeter. So this is one-fourth of one millimeter. So 0.25 millimeters then is the size of the hole. So that's the idea of number three.
Now, moving on to, to number four. Uh, number four has us looking, it looks like a, a lens, the geometric lens is here. So I guess this is chapter, what, 30, 36 here. Um, and again, kind of uh, two pieces here that we need to uh, put together. Uh, the first one is just the general idea of a, of a lens equation. So 1 over P plus 1 over Q is equal to 1 over, over F. And the other thing is when you're building the lens, we call it the lens maker equation, is that the focal length is determined by, and of course it's controlled by the bending of the light, and the bending of the light has to do with the index it's made out of, okay, but also then how much... Uh, bending there is in the in the glass, curving in the glass, and there, uh, of course a glass surface, the light has to go in and then the light has to come out, so there would be two uh, curvatures uh, to it. And so more on this in just a second, but if I, if I come over to here, it says the object is placed 20 centimeters away, so there's my, my 20 uh, centimeters. And I don't really know the focal length here, but it says that the idea is to make it three times uh, bigger and put on a screen. Uh, now, this is important here because we know the magnification is a minus Q over a P. And they say three times bigger, but there's a little hint that say that upside down is okay. In fact, it's not just okay, it's required because this uh, lens, if you remember, can make things bigger and right side up. So in other words, a positive three, but only if they're virtual. So you can't put it on a screen. And the fact that it's on a screen tells, and it's bigger, uh, the fact it's on a screen tells you it's a real. And so we've got to make the light really go onto this screen, uh, which is why when you make a little projector like this, like some of the, you know, displays, the, uh, like the one we have in class, the digital display, you actually uh, form, the computer forms the image inside upside down, so by the time it goes through the optics, it inverts it. So, of course, on the outside world, it looks right side up. If any of you ever worked with the old-fashioned slides, those were always kind of interesting because you would, you know, these little, you know, square slides that you would put in the carousel and you'd push a little button and go from one slide it would drop in in front of the lens and it was real important that you make sure you put that uh slide in upside down and uh, so that it would invert and then be up on the on the screen and look right side up and uh if you ask maybe some of your parents who ever did a, a slideshow it was very common going through a slideshow and you know you're going along everything's going fine all of a sudden one's upside down because it was your looking at them and assembling them, it's just so natural to, to look at it and hold it right side up and put it in a little carousel right side up. And if you do that, then it's going to be wrong on the screen. Anyways, but that's a long way of saying is they say it is three, but they really mean it is for you to figure out it has to be a negative three. So, therefore, if we run through the map, that negative and that negative cancel. So, Q is 3 times P, which is then a positive 60. Now, again, notice positive because we've got to get a real uh, image. And so, if we put that over here, we got 1 over 20 uh, plus 1 over uh, 60 equals to 1 over F. And so, if we put these uh, numbers in here into our uh, equation... Uh, we will get f to be 15 centimeters. So there's the the first half of it. And like I said, a big one is is right here, realizing it's got to be a real image because it's on the screen, realizing that can only happen when it's inverted. So the magnification, it's not even just okay to be a negative 3. It must be a negative 3. Okay, so, so there's the uh, first half. And now we'll put it together with this. And so... Uh, 1 over 15 equals, and so the focal length, as I mentioned earlier, depends on uh, these three factors because we're, we're bending the light, and the bending of the light occurs going in and coming out, so it depends on the curvature coming in and coming out of the lens, but it also depends on what the material is made out of, and so uh, this stuff is made out of flint glass, so this would be 1.66 minus 1, 
and I'll call this the first uh, radius because they say the lens that we have is really shaped like this. And so this first surface is the R1. And then minus, and then this is a, a flat surface. And a flat surface means that we really have a piece of a circle that's so big uh, that its radius is infinite. It's uh, sort of like standing on the beach and looking out. And um, if you're not real careful, you might think the Earth is flat. Uh, the Earth's radius is just so big that it appears to be uh, flat. Uh, nobody would say a tennis ball is flat. There, the radius is so small, it's very clear that it is curved. But as the radius gets bigger and bigger, it's harder to tell that it's, it's curved, uh, especially if you're standing real, real close to it, like, you know, you standing on the, on the Earth. So this is radius number two, but there's kind of the key that radius number two has an infinite uh, radius. So you can see the only thing we don't know is radius number one, and so that gives us 9.9 .9 centimeters for the, the radius. And so that's the, 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 the two pieces uh, uh, there. And then finally, the last problem, uh, number five here, is a compound lens system. Uh, and with a compound lens system, we have this first lens, and then I'll just leave that where it is for now. But uh, we know that this is 30 away, and oh, we know this is two centimeters tall. Um, we know that there's gonna put another lens here uh, that is eventually gonna be 40, but I'll hold off on that for just a second because they do say that this uh, lens has a focal length of 20 here. And so if I do the first step, the 1 over P plus the 1 over Q equals the 1 over F, I get the object is 30 away, okay, on the Q, and the focal length is then uh, a 20. And so if I run through the math, I get 60. And again, notice it's positive. Uh, if I take a moment and do the magnification, which is minus Q over P, that would be minus 60 over a 30. And so that makes a negative 2. And so this image, not worrying about this, second lens for just a second, would form right about here. It would be upside down and it would be twice as big. And of course, if we put a screen right, right there, then you know we would have this image upside down and twice as big. And the light would actually be there, it's a real image, and we, 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 we could see it on the screen. And so if we were in the audience, great. But what ends up happening is there is a lens, and we're not really sure what kind of lens it is. Although I guess that's what we're gonna find out in part A. Part A says what is the, the focal uh, length. Uh, the goal is to get the image on the screen, which they say then is another 100 centimeters from this, this lens. So if we apply then, our equation for the second lens, knowing that the image from the first lens right here is the, ob uh, the uh, object for the second, this distance is 20. But this is the hard one that it is a virtual object. This is where the light is coming in and so it'd be kind of coming down this direction and it's on its way to converge right here and make an image. Uh, that will not happen. Uh, it won't make an image till it gets here. Um, and so to keep it from forming an image, we're going to have to uh, put it to something that's gonna kind of spread the light. So instead of it grouping right here and forming an image, 
it's got to spread out a little bit. And so that tells me that this really has to be a negative focal length or a concave uh, a lens. Uh, I'll see that in the math. I don't need to actually draw the, the rays or anything. And so I'll put in my uh, object distance, negative. Then I get my Q and then my 1 over F. And then maybe a big step is to realize I'm trying to get it on the screen. And so this is the 100. So I got a negative 1 over 20 uh, plus a 1 over 100 equals 1 over my focal length. And maybe I should call that focal length 2 because up here this was focal length 1. And so focal length 2 comes out to be a negative 25 centimeters. So there's the answer to A. That is, uh, the focal length is a negative 25. It is a concave lens. It is one that needs to spread the uh, light out. And, of course, we're also going to see uh, in this picture that it's upside down. The first lens made it upside down, and the second lens really didn't do anything other than keep the light from converging. It would have converted here, but now it, it kind of keeps it from, uh, it's a diverging lens, so it keeps it from making the image right here. It makes it a little further out. So we would expect it to be upside down and even, even bigger. In fact, we can even see what is the magnification of this second lens. And so maybe I'd call this magnification number one, but the second one would be a minus a, a Q over a P and so this is minus 100, and remember our, our P was negative 20, and so that makes a positive 5. So notice it does make it bigger, five times bigger actually, uh, but the plus means it doesn't uh, invert it. So the uh, object for the second lens was already upside down, and this doesn't invert it or anything, so it's still going to finish upside down. Or to say the same thing, the total magnification then is the two together. Uh, how much bigger or smaller, but in this case, it's bigger, negative 2, do we get from the first lens? So it's 2 times bigger and upside down. And then the second one is 5 times bigger, but not inverted. And overall, then, makes it 10 times uh, bigger. Uh, now, one more quick step, then. So the height would then be this magnification times its original height. So the magnification is negative 10 and its original height is 2 centimeters, and so 2 times 10 is negative 20, and so what is the size of the image is negative 20. Don't, don't stop here at the magnification. Some of you did, but this is the, really the, the answer. What's the size? All right, hopefully that was helpful.